it was a great time for the Western Roman Empire. After decades of defeats, disasters and utter chaos, it seemed that the star of the Western Romans was rising again. In the time span of only two years, the heroic Western Emperor Majorian, with the help of his very able generals Nepotianus, Aegidius and Marcellinus, had managed to almost restore the Western Roman Empire. However, of course, the conquest was not yet finished. Majorian knew that there could be only true lasting peace in the Western Roman Hemisphere if the Vandal threat was defeated once and for all. The same way that the Romans knew 700 years prior that Rome would need to conquer Punic Africa if it wanted to dominate the Mediterranean, the same way Majorian knew that the Vandal Kingdom would need to be utterly crushed and reincorporated into the Western Roman Empire as a province as it had been only 25 years earlier, if Rome wanted to be free. To this end, Majorian had built a massive fleet, the largest fleet the Western Roman Empire had seen in centuries. The Emperor Constantine had basically stolen the Western Roman fleet and used it in order to defeat his rival Licinius at the Battle of Hellespont some 140 years before Majorian's time. Since then, the West found itself without a fleet, because after that, the fleet would be stationed at Constantinople. Majorian had changed that. His newly built massive fleet comprised 300 warships, a size not seen in the West since the days of old. And after reconquering large parts of Gallia and Hispania, he had amassed his fleet at Portus Illicitanus, an old Roman port near the city of Carthago Nova. News of Majorian's outstanding successes reached the court of the Vandal King Geyseric at Carthago, especially the gathering of a large fleet, something that Geyseric had not seen the Western Empire doing in all his time as a king. And the fact that even the Visigoths now had become foederati of the Western Empire had Geyseric become fearful of the Romans for the first time ever. So Geyseric decided to send envoys to the Emperor at Carthago Nova, the first time ever that Geyseric did this, which shows just how much he now feared this new strong Western Roman Empire. But Majorian refused Geyseric's terms and sent the envoys back. He knew that in order to achieve lasting peace, the Vandal Kingdom had to be utterly destroyed and Geyseric to be either captured or killed. Geyseric, upon receiving back his envoys with the news that the Emperor refused the peace terms, in his panic ordered the burning of Mauretania, for that is the region where Geyseric suspected that Majorian would land. He hoped that this scorched earth strategy would slow down Majorian's advance after unloading his troops. Meanwhile, all this time since 458 AD, in those two years where Majorian had achieved success after success, victory after victory, subjugating the Burgundians, the Suevi and even the fierce Visigoths, all this time Ricimer had been left in Italy. We can only imagine what must have gone on in his mind when hearing that his old friend was being cheered on like a new Trajan while he himself was sitting idly in Italy and none was cheering for him. The people loved Majorian and not him. The jealousy was growing stronger each day. Ricimer, it seems, did not care for the restoration of the Western Roman Empire. What he cared for most were his own selfish desires. And so he must have decided one day that Majorian was in his way. Thus he began to surround himself with others critical of the new emperor, others that were dissatisfied with the emperor's many reforms, his many new laws targeting corruption, his laws that were designed to end the very corruption that had weakened the Western Roman state. Many rich aristocrats and senators had profited for decades from that corruption, from the unfair Roman system, from exploiting the lower classes, and hence they were very unpleased with this new ambitious emperor. So far had the old virtue of the Romans sunk that a large part of the aristocracy cared more for their immediate wealth than for the glory of Rome. And so Ricimer began surrounding himself with such people and they abided their time. Meanwhile in Africa, according to the historian Procopius of Caesarea, who wrote about Majorian 70 years later in around 530 AD, Majorian wanted to gather intelligence about the strength of the Vandals. 
To this end, he dyed his hair and disguised himself as an envoy and traveled to meet Geyserik himself at Carthago. Now we can be quite sure that this was probably a legend, but there might be a grain of truth in it in as far as to show with what great care the emperor was planning the invasion of Africa, this D-Day of late antiquity. So while the emperor was still preparing for the invasion, his entire fleet was stationed at Portus Illicitanus and possibly at Elche, near Carthago Nova. While Geyseric thought that Majorian would land at Mauretania, there are indications that in reality he wanted to first land at Sicily and meet with Marcellinus of Dalmatia. These united Roman fleets and armies would then land somewhere, probably where Geyseric did not suspect it, in order to surprise and confuse the Vandal enemy and catch them completely off guard. This was in August of 460 AD. We don't know exactly where Majorian was during that time or what exactly he was doing, but it was during this time that fate would now turn against the Romans. We have several sources for what happened next, but they are all quite vague. Priscus of Panium and John of Antioch simply wrote that the Roman fleet was destroyed by the Vandals, possibly in a surprise attack. Hudatius, however, wrote that it was traitors who set the fleet on fire. And this is something which we can easily imagine, since we know that Majorian's army was comprised entirely of barbarian mercenaries. Thus, their allegiance was not as much to the glory of Rome, but more to the glory of coin and often to their own Germanic tribes. For the fighting power of the Romans themselves had deteriorated so much that there were not many Romans fighting anymore in the Roman army itself. It is thus very conceivable that some elements in this mostly barbarian army could have been bribed by the Vandals. Geyseric, rich from the spoils of his sack of Rome just a few years earlier, certainly possessed the necessary coin in order to bribe almost everyone but the most diehard believers in the glory of Rome. And there were in those times, unfortunately, not many of them left who shared this idealistic vision with the emperor. Apart from the Vandals, the Visigoths could also have been the source of this treachery and even Rikimer himself has been suspected by some historians Although I have to say that this last possibility seems unplausible despite the fact that Rikimer was a very questionable character. In my opinion, the Vandals were the most likely culprit. And thus, while the Emperor was apparently not directly present at the scene, possibly not too far away busy with his preparations, traitors might have set the fleet on fire at night before it was even boarded with soldiers and provisions. And so, in one fell swoop, in one stealthy action, the hopes of the Romans went up in flames. Thus burned this new Western Roman armada, before it could even set out to accomplish what it was built for. We don't know what went through the Emperor's mind when he heard of the disaster, and what he said or thought when he quite probably saw it later with his own eyes. All his preparations destroyed in such an inglorious way. This must have been a brutal blow for this heroic character who had almost managed to become a second Aurelian. He had come so close to be called Restitutor Orbis like Aurelian before him, but now it went all up in smoke. This was Majorian's first big mistake. He had underestimated the disloyalty of his barbarian mercenaries and the extreme cunning of Geyseric. He had become maybe a bit too sure of himself after the last years of permanent victories. Such is sometimes the fate of characters that rise too high too fast. And so he was forced to sign a probably humiliating peace treaty with the Vandal King. And once again, through sheer cunning, Geyseric had come out the victor as he had time and time again since he had crossed into Africa with his Vandals over 30 years earlier. The Romans had underestimated the ruthlessness of Geyseric time and time again, and they would do so another time in 468 at the failed landing of Cape Bon. What Majorian did immediately afterwards, we do not know. He might have possibly stayed in Hispania for a few more months. He kept his army, and at some point he made way back for Arelate, to the very city where his victories had begun more than two years prior. But this time, 
his mood was quite certainly a lot worse than when fate was still on his side. We do know, however, that Majorian arrived at Arelate probably sometime in early 461. Sidonius Apollinaris, who wrote an extensive panegyric for the emperor, was also present in that city when the emperor arrived. We have a quite interesting surviving piece of writing from Sidonius himself, in which he writes of a banquet where Majorian, Sidonius and some Gallo-Roman noblemen attended. Remarkably, nothing of importance was spoken at this banquet, and it seems that the heavy defeat against the Vandals had not tarnished the Emperor's reputation, nor did it manage to diminish the love of the Gallo-Romans towards this noble Emperor. The Emperor supposedly was even in a good mood, smiling and jesting. We can assume, however, that this was part of the panegyric style, in which the Emperor was portrayed in a positive light. Even if Majorian was in a good mood during that banquet, we can be quite sure that it was all facade. Majorian was quite likely very unhappy and sad, but he didn't want to let it show. And indeed, in one letter of Sidonius Apollinaris, he wrote that after the banquet was over, the Emperor's face began to pale. It almost froze, as Sidonius recalled as if the order had been given to stretch out his neck to the drawn sword of the executioner, in the very words of Sidonius Apollinaris. Sidonius also mentioned that Majorian apparently attended the games in the arena of Arelate. What type of games is not specified, but since gladiatorial games had been abolished some years earlier, we can assume that it must have been venatorial games where the venatores, the animal hunters, would hunt and kill wild beasts, a not much less bloody spectacle, which all too often also ended badly for the venatores themselves, a brutal spectacle which was still practiced in the Colosseum at Rome even 70 years later in the kingdom of Theoderic. Majorian attended these games, and since he was a traditionalist who wanted to restore the glory of Rome, he knew how important traditions were, even the more brutal ones. At some point in the summer of 461, Majorian decided to leave Arelate, and now his second big mistake would follow. He disbanded his barbarian army that he had recruited two and a half years earlier in northern Italy. This indicates to us that he had no knowledge of Ricimer's plottings. He might have indeed been quite unsuspecting of Ricimer's treacherous plans, which is very surprising to us, but it is always easy to judge someone in hindsight. Rikima might possibly have been masterful at concealing his true intents, a character possibly as brutal, as ruthless, egoistic, greedy and cunning as Geyserik himself. How Majorian could have made such a mistake is baffling to us, but it proves that even the great ones make mistakes. The facade of Rikima must have been perfect. Majorian must have really believed that he had nothing to fear of his supposed old friend with whom he had overturned the previous emperor Avitus and with whom he had served together under Aetius. And so he kept only a few personal bodyguards with whom he traveled from Arelate to Italy and fascinatingly he was not headed for Ravenna but for Rome, according to Eudatius. It seems that he planned to reside in Rome like Valentinian III and Avitus before him making Rome once again the seat of the emperor, something which later emperors would also do, such as Antemius or Olybrius. Indeed, Rome in those days was once again the capital of this dying Western Roman Empire. And Majorian intended to stay there and according to Edatius, even to enact some laws and reforms and to continue his restoration of the Western Roman Empire, despite his setback against the Vandals. It was thus in early August 461 that Ricimer intercepted the emperor at the city of Tertona, modern-day Tortona in Liguria, while the emperor passed through this city on his way to Rome. We can be quite sure that while Majorian only had his few bodyguard troops, Ricimer appeared with a sizable army. How exactly Ricimer knew where Majorian was and how to intercept him again shows that spies and treacherous people were abound these days, ready to reveal any information and do any deed that would help to destroy the Roman state in exchange for coin. To such lows had the ancient ideals of Rome fallen that its very inhabitants wished to see it die. Majorian was taken prisoner, quite likely beaten, and thrown into a dungeon. 
because he was not immediately executed. Two days later, the emperor was then beheaded near the river Ira, very likely the modern river Scrivia. Whether Rikima was watching or not, we do not know, but judging his character, this might have very well been the case. And so ended the life of the noble Emperor Majorian, a character who, as Gibbon wrote, was anxious to protect the monuments of those ages in which he would have desired and deserved to live. Indeed, Majorian was born in an age in which the Western Roman state had fallen to such lows that even he could not save it anymore. The corruption ran too deep, the unfairness of the justice system was too rampant, the lower classes exploited by the rich, traitors were everywhere, and we saw that the emperor's single big character flaw was that he underestimated to which lows the people of the empire had fallen, how very corrupted it had become. Senators, aristocrats, the soldiers, they did not care for Rome anymore. The Roman Empire had become an idea for them, unworthy of preservation. Majorian's biggest flaw was that he did not see this or did not want to see this. He hoped that this illness could be still cured through reforms and laws. But even the best emperor cannot have ears and eyes everywhere, and so treachery struck twice. First when the traitors burned the fleet at Portus Illicitanus, and then when Ricimer intercepted him. And Ricimer found certainly many allies in his plottings against the emperor, allies who wanted this reformer gone, so that they could return back to exploiting the system and enriching themselves. And with Majorian, so died the last hopes for the full restoration of the Western Roman Empire. Nepotianus, Egidius and Marcellinus all died not long after him, his able friends and commanders, without whose help he would not have achieved his many victories. And with them gone too, the Western Roman state unraveled ever more quickly. And so, only 15 years after the death of Majorian, the last de facto Western Roman Emperor was deposed and the Western Empire ceased to be an independent state. But instead, Italy became part of the Eastern Roman Empire with the seat of the emperor in Constantinople and on the rule of the Germanic Patricius Odoacer. And what then remains of Majorian's legacy? When Bishop Enodius of Pavia visited Tertona in the late 5th century, some 30 years after the emperor's sad ending, he noted with sadness, Look with shame on the great shrines of the unworthy, for modest tombs are raised for pious princes. It is very likely that Enodius was referencing the mausoleum of Majorian at Tertona, a mausoleum which was very modest. Indeed it seems the great princes often meet the worst endings and I hope that with this channel and with this very detailed video series on the life of Majorian that maybe a bit of his legacy survives for future generations because it was only recently that historians started to acknowledge the extent of Majorian's restoration and to acknowledge that the Western Roman Empire might have been saved even as late as the 460s had history gone differently. I hope I can contribute a bit to spread knowledge of this very remarkable character who indeed, as Gibbon wrote, would have deserved to live in better times and to see Rome when it was in its prime. I personally visited the tomb of Majorian at Tortona because I wanted to see this modest tomb for such pious a prince myself. Not much remains of that mausoleum, which was very likely hastily built by the inhabitants of Tertona for the emperor whom they had loved and certainly not built by Rikimer. The mausoleum is attached to a church and only a small plaque indicates that this heroic character was buried here. One can reach the mausoleum itself through the backyard and the interior of the mausoleum can only be reached through a hidden cellar door, which some friendly locals opened up for me and my wife when we visited the tomb last year. There is not much to see there, not much left which would indicate that a Western Roman emperor ever lay here. The sarcophagus or any decorations have long since been removed as Tortona was almost completely destroyed in the wars of the Middle Ages and the mausoleum then possibly looted and burned. And so what remains of Majorian is only his memory, the memory of someone who can show us that despite all odds we can still try to achieve the impossible and that if we try hard enough 
we actually might even achieve it. Majorian will always be remembered. And to not let this video end so sadly, I have planned an alternate version of events, an alternate happy ending timeline for Majorian, in which his Vandal campaign would have been successful, and in which he grew old and reigned for many more years as emperor of a restored Western Roman Empire, in which the flame of Rome shone brightly once again. And if you are a Rome nerd like me, and chances are pretty high that you are if you are watching this video, then you might be interested in the incredible rings and other Roman accessories which the SPQR shop is building. And now you can even order the one and only Majorianus channel ring in order to honor the great Emperor Majorian to whose memory I dedicated this channel. As you can see, it is wonderfully handcrafted and you can see the incredible amount of detail and craftsmanship that the amazing people from SPQR shop invested into this ring. And you can order one in bronze and even silver. I wonder what Majorian would say to that, could he see that his memory still shines brightly 1562 years after his death. This is a must for every true Majorian fan and of course as a nice side effect, it would greatly help this channel in order to spread the word about the heroes of the late Roman Empire. I put the link to their shop in the video description and into the pinned comment and with this link you can get a 10% rebate on every purchase if you type in the rebate code Majorianus. So go and check out their sortiment, it's really quite incredible. And please like this video and subscribe so that you won't miss any future videos on the fascinating era of the late Roman Empire. And please consider supporting my work on Patreon or via YouTube membership because the long-term sustainability of this channel really depends on your support. This channel would not work without our amazing Patreon and YouTube members and I want to thank each and everyone who is supporting this channel in any form be it Patreon, YouTube membership or PayPal donations or of course simply by watching. It is thanks to people like you that Majorian's name and legacy continue to shine brightly so long after his death. Gratias Tibiago Amiki. And if you want to see the first video of this trilogy of Majorian, you can watch this video in the upper right corner and you can watch the second video of this series in the lower right corner. I say thanks again to all friends of Roman history, gratias Tibiago and bene valete.